Welcome, everybody. We're going to be starting in just a couple of minutes. Okay, well, I like make that two minutes. So let's get started. Good morning, everyone. Um, welcome to day two of our Climate Action Summit to support businesses in delivering a net zero future. I'm Jessica Lobo. I'm the Global Goals and Climate Program Manager here at the UN Global Compact Network UK and really delighted to see so many people joining us for our, our fifth session of the summit, Frameworks for Managing Nature-Related Risks. So before we get started, just a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, this event is being recorded. Um, it will be made available after the session ends. So um, in, a, in shortly, we'll be sharing links to everybody that's registered for the session. And then uh, later on, we'll make it available on the website. So the recording will be available um, to everybody that's joining us. We are in webinar mode, so um, unfortunately you're not going to be able to unmute yourselves, but we are hoping for a really lively uh, Q&A later on um, in the session. So please do um, send questions for our panellists into that Q&A box. And in the Q&A box, you have an option to vote on the questions that you would like to be answered most. So we will be using that later on for the Q&A. Please do get all of your questions in there and then we can, uh, we can manage that and get through as many as possible possible. There is also the chat function. Um, so please go ahead and use it to introduce yourself if you want to share LinkedIn profile, tell us where you're dialing in from. Um, we will also be, if you've got any technical issues, please do uh, use that chat box too. But if you've got questions, like I said, please put them in the Q&A box because we won't be able to get to any of the questions in the, in the chat box. We are activating automatic captions, um, which you can choose to accept in the tools bar. These captions are generated automatically by Zoom, so please forgive us for any typos or, or mistakes that are made by the programme. And I think my last bit of, uh, of housekeeping really is that um, we want to have a really great, lively conversation today, but we want it to continue after this session and even after, to, after today. So please do join the conversation online. Use the hashtag uh, CA Summit 2022. Um, share your thoughts, your key takeaways, uh, anything that's inspired you today. It would be great for us to continue that conversation. And I think that might be all of my housekeeping. So. Um, on to the next slide, thank you. If this is your first uh, summit session or, or even first time joining one of our, our events, um, just to give you a little bit of an introduction of who we are. We are part of the UN Global Compact, which is the world's largest corporate sustainability initiative. Today we have over 17,000 business members worldwide and another 4,000 or so uh, non-business members who have all committed to our 10 principles to support sustainability. And these principles are derived from universal treaties in the areas of human rights, labour, environment and anti-corruption. Um, they form a rock solid uh, basis for any corporate sustainability programme or supplier code of conduct. And so if you're looking to join and if you're not already a member, then I definitely encourage you to have a look at it. We ask our members to commit to three pieces. So the first is to operationalise those 10 principles. The second is to report annually on progress. And the third is to support the wider UN development agenda. Here in the, the UK network, we're also um, we're the largest corporate sustainability initiative in the UK. Um, we've got over 700 business members now and, and almost 850 participants in total. 
Our mission really is to turn this global momentum on sustainability into practical action. We have three main work streams, business and human rights, climate action and global goals. And I think deliver more than 100 events a year now uh, to support our members and, of course, uh, the wider business community here in the UK. But today we are focusing just on climate action um, and how we can support businesses to implement practical and effective solutions to reach net zero and build further business, societal and environmental resilience. So uh, this is our first nature themed uh, session of the summit. Uh, we're looking forward to a really interesting discussion about the different kinds of nature related frameworks for measuring impact and risk. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce our all-star lineup of speakers this morning. Um, so we've got Mark Goff, who is the CEO at uh, Capitals Coalition. We've got Andrew Mitchell, Vice Chair at the uh, TNFD Stewardship Council and Founder and Senior Advisor of Global Canopy. We've got Sarah Dyson, who is the Head of Corporate Responsibility at GSK. And we've got Annabelle Nelson, who is the Head of ESG Policy and Disclosure at M&G. So uh, what's going to happen this morning, each of our speakers is going to um, share about a 10 minute presentation and then we're going to have a 35 minute uh, Q&A with our executive director, Steve Kenzie. So, as I mentioned, please do while the presentations are going, get all of those questions in for our speakers into the Q&A box and start voting on the ones that you want us to, to get into a deeper conversation with. But before we go on to that, uh, let's hand over to our first speaker, Mark, from uh, Capitals Coalition. So, Mark, over to you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Sorry, and welcome, everyone. I'm suffering from that cold that's going around at the moment, but fortunately we're on Zoom, so you have no chance of catching it. Um, so I'm the Chief Executive of the Capitals Coalition, uh, which used to be the Natural Capital Coalition, um, which brought together all of those people that were thinking about natural capital, thinking about the value that nature brings to societies, to their own businesses. If we can go to the next slide. The first thing I'm going to do, which might be slightly odd when we're talking about nature on this session five today, is just to bring it back down to how all of these things are interconnected. The reason why we've got a problem at the moment with biodiversity loss with nature is because in the form of capitals, we're increasing our financial capital, the produced bit that's going up there quite considerably. The human capital is increasing slightly, although there's massive inequalities around the world, as we know, um, particularly being drawn out more recently and more obvious. Um, but that's all coming because we're drawing down upon the other capital, natural capital. There's only a finite number of resources here and to make that produced in human capital we're drawing down on the natural capital and that's what's causing the problem this comes from the das Gupta review which did the economics of nature which were released a couple of years ago a great report if you haven't read it already if we go on to the next slide <clears throat> so what is capitals capitals is the difference between a stock a flow and a value. And a good example of this, uh, one of my previous jobs, I worked for 20 years in uh, corporate positions uh, in companies or thereabouts. And uh, the last one I was with was the Crown Estate. And uh, in the Crown Estate, at the end of every year, all of the uh, finance that's been created through that year goes to treasury, it goes into the public purse. But the assets stay with the Crown Estate. So at the beginning of the year, all they've got is the stock. They haven't got any of the money. The bank account says zero. So because of that, they have to invest all that year in what they are doing in the land. Um, so if the soil quality deteriorates during that year, their asset is worth less at the end of the year. So they have to make sure that the soil quality stays high because the stock, the assets are separate to that flow, the money, the benefits that are coming from it. Now, that way of thinking is really key. If every business started thinking about their stock and that they have to draw down on, that they depend upon every year, the nature that they depend upon, the pollinators, the water, the clean air, all of those sort of things, and the people and the social capital, if they invested in that throughout the year, which is the general premise here, then they would have greater flows. If we deteriorate that, the same as if you take all your money out of the bank, you're not going to make any more interest, are you? If you then actually owe the bank money, you end up paying them. And that's what's happening now with all of these capitals. If we go on to the next slide. So there's three different ways that we're looking at the coalition, which is around 25,000 individuals around the world that we're sort of helping to curate in about 13,000 organizations that are working on this idea of value at the moment. But this is growing every day. There's more and more people thinking about what they're doing around the value that they create in their road. The first thing is, is there, two, there are two internationally accepted frameworks written into the European Green Deal, written into legislation in the US and various other places. These protocols harmonize the work that's been going on. So you might hear of lots of different branded methods, but they come underneath 
these overarching frameworks. They're simple step-by-step -step processes that you can follow. That's great. But what we're doing at the moment is we're integrating. We're making sure that actually we're not just looking at natural alone. We're looking at natural, social, human and the produced and financial together. And that will be coming out later this year. The value commission is also key to be able to convert um, an output. So most sustainability reports at the moment include outputs. They'll tell you a thousand tons of carbon has been produced. They'll tell you a thousand cubic meters of water, a thousand new jobs, a thousand new pollinators, etc. That doesn't mean very much because it's not explaining the benefits, the, the impact, the dependency. To get to those, you need to times it by a number. Well, the value commission is setting the rules about how we go about that valuation and will make available a freely accessible database for all of those coefficients. So all of those numbers that you report on all of those GRI, GRI criteria and other things that you've got, you'll be able to convert those into the impact on society and on business. There's lots of other things going on on Change of Conversation. The US is uh, the 88th, I think, country now to sign up to adopt natural capital accounting. That happened this year. We've also got local hubs around the world that are specifically looking at these biodiversity questions. It's a local issue. That we're trying to deal with. So we've got hubs all over the world. In fact, this week and next week, we're running global dialogues with those hubs to introduce um, other local people into those conversations. And really importantly, at the end of this year, we've got the Biodiversity COP, COP15. So this has uh, been delayed by two years. It was meant to be in China in 2020. That was going to be the year of all of these things coming together. It's because of COVID. It's now going to be in Montreal in December. It's happening the same time as the World Cup, just in case you wanted to know the timing. So with this, we are, there's three bits to it. One, a global biodiversity framework where we've got to make sure that we're trying to get nature positive into it. So that will be a new agreement by all of the countries. Secondly, target 15 is make it mandatory. This is calling from businesses for a mandatory approach to assessment and disclosure of the impacts and dependencies. So it's the next step in this sustainability piece. It's no longer reporting on just those outputs, those numbers, the thousands of this, thousands of that. It's going as far as saying, so what does that mean? What's the impact on the world? And that is where we're going to be able to understand our dependency, our impact upon nature much better. And there's a campaign for that. You can go onto our website and find more if you're a business and want to be involved. We're also taking business leaders. We've had over 400 already apply on our delegation to those negotiations if you want to have a say in what's going on. But please do think about that. The third one is subsidies. And if you look here, we did a study a couple of, uh, a couple of months back with uh, um, the B team, which is Richard Branson's uh, piece, and also uh, the uh, Business for Nature, which um, I helped to establish a few years ago as an advocacy arm leading into this. And that pointed out that $1.8 trillion is actually going in the wrong direction. So no matter what frameworks we get, no matter what natural capital accounting, no matter how much we measure what we're doing and try and manage it, if the money is going in the other direction, it's not going to work. So we need to look at those subsidies and change the rules. We need to change the accounting rules. We need to change the financial rules. But we also need to change the subsidies and the direction of money. And this is getting a lot of traction. That's target 18 in the COP um, uh, 15 uh, negotiations. If we go to the next slide. Just a couple more things. So uh, there's lots of advances in biodiversity. Here's a few of them. Um, I was part of the CEO group that set up this global goal for nature. We were sitting there 2018, 2019, looking at the, uh, the, the 1.5 degrees that there is for climate and saying there isn't one really for biodiversity. So a group of us met in Geneva. We sat down and said, we're not going to leave the room until we come out with something. We came out with this idea of nature positive by 2030. And what that means is that by 2030, we need to be able to have more nature than we do today. Now, this is quite ethereal, I get that. It's a direction, it's a North Star, a Southern Cross that we're moving in. It's not meant to be a measurement that you take, that's coming now through this process, but it has got con um, convergence from governments, from businesses behind it. It's very easy to uh, link in with the climate neutral agenda, nature positive, climate neutral and equitable future. And that is starting to get traction and that's what we need to build towards. The next thing is uh, PBAF, you're probably aware of this and I'll show you where this fits in in a moment, doing a lot of work on the financial sector institutions and how we can disclose those impacts and dependencies. Andrew's going to tell us a lot more about TNFD in a moment, a brilliant initiative. We've just brought out some connections showing how our work feeds into TNFD and some of the things that we did. In fact, I did with Andrew a few years ago, very much uh, helping to 
put the basis down for that. We've got a line, a project which we're involved with, which is bringing together all of the biodiversity measurements. And we've come out with the beta framework for that at the moment. This is can making more consistency and standardization around that. And there's also, we've developed a navigation tool which will help you through those biodiversity um, uh, uh, measurements and evaluations, uh, which you can find on our website as well. <clears throat> Next slide. I'm just gonna run you through very quickly and then I'll finish. Uh, there's lots of different initiatives. It can be very confusing. All of these seem to say something similar, but something slightly different. We go to the next slide. <clears throat> so what we did is we brought together the CEOs of most of those organizations, and we sat down, and there's many more that have joined since those at the bottom of the list, and we agreed that there's consistency in what we do. That actually what you should do for high-level business actions for nature is, first of all, you assess. Then you go through and you commit. Then you transform, you make an action on what you're doing, and then what you do is you disclose. OK, if you go on to the next slide, what we've then done is we've connected this all up in a chart to show how that assess, commit, transform, disclose, then goes on to where we need to make it connect with finance and then through with government. So with the finance, you've got allocation of finance. With the governments, you've got changing the rules as part of their transformation. But the thing that connects all of this, that makes all of this work, is value. If we have a consistent understanding of the value of nature, the value that nature provides to us, then this loop works. Then we have a system that is self-supported and starts becoming sustainable. It's when we do it in individual parts that it breaks apart. So if I can go to the last slide now. What we've been able to do is think about some of the organizations in our network and some of those others that are really key and start to map some of those across this. So that Align project I talked about, which is standardizing the biodiversity measurements at the moment, about over 20 different measurements, bringing them together, getting a consistent approach to that, that is in the assess bit. So that will help you do those assessments. You then go to the science-based targets for nature for the commitments. 66% of the businesses that work with us at the moment are now working on science-based targets with Erin Billman and everyone else at that team. Then you go through to the transformation, which is there's lots of consultants, lots of people. The UN Global Compact can help you with some of that thinking about how to transform. And then through to disclose as well, where you have the TNFD, very importantly, but also the IFRS and those other disclosure standards feeding it through into the rest of this loop. And this shows you actually that it isn't a complete mess of different initiatives. This is a, a, an individual toolbox that helps you to be able to deliver the system change that you want to achieve. This is how we're going to achieve Nature Positive. And on that note, I'll end there. Thank you very much. Mark, thank you very much. That was brilliant. And particularly that um, that slide that you've got up at the moment, which shows just how uh, how connected all of this is and, and how we can really go about that systems change. So looking forward to diving into that a little bit more later. For now, um, let me hand over to our, our next speaker, Andrew Mitchell, who is the Vice Chair at uh, TNFD Stewards of Council and Founder and Senior Advisor at Global Canopy. Uh, Andrew, over to you. Uh, thank you very much, Jessica. And thank you, Mark, for uh, absolutely splendid uh, setting out the, the stall, in a sense, uh, the case for the nature positive. And I think it's a great goal to aim for, nature positive by 2030. We need a, a simple high level goal. Actually, working with nature is, is, is pretty difficult because we don't have targets as we do for climate. We don't have uh, the equivalent of a 1.5 degrees in the nature space and we don't have a currency uh, like a ton of carbon. Uh, to work with and that we're hoping that uh, COP15 will shed some light on these and there are lots of people beginning to work on it and and, and one of the organizations that uh, is involved with this is TNFD which is the task force on nature related financial disclosure uh, which I'm the vice chair of of the stewardship council which is the the donors who are putting the money together but I've been involved with this right from the beginning and working with World Wildlife Fund UNDP uh, UNEPFI and, and, and Global Canopy to sort of catalyze it. And it, it's, it's now taken off around the world with tremendous support from um, the global community in business and finance. Um, and it is trying to come up with a, a risk management and a, a disclosure framework for nature, uh, which is pretty difficult. Uh, no one's ever done it before, but I keep saying to people to reassure them that, you know, uh, whatever we come out with in September next year, um, is going to be better than what we have now because today we have nothing. So uh, we're putting together the best minds in the world uh, together with 35 plus uh, financial institutions, corporates and others uh, to work on this. It's a tremendous group of uh, academics and knowledge partners as well. 
and there's a forum uh, that you can join with uh, I think over 650 members in it now people are leaning in trying to make this happen so let's go to the next slide um, uh, and I I'm I'm a zoologist originally and uh, worked through Global Canopy, which is a think tank in Oxford. And I just want to remind you of the intersection between nature and climate <clears throat> and to to stop you thinking about something. Because usually when we talk about biodiversity, it immediately you start thinking of butterflies and bees. And, and that gives us, I think, the wrong understanding of what we're really talking about. The point is that nature is huge infrastructure that helps keep the earth safe. And if we look after it, it'll help keep your business safe and it'll help keep our pensions safe. And the problem is that we're degrading nature at a fast date. As you know, we're also polluting the atmosphere through a lot of emissions. And, um, and the, the climate is just the first step into the room. And the other thing to understand is that nature uh, sucks carbon out of the atmosphere, stores it, huge forests, huge oceans. These are really big pieces of infrastructure that are looking after our climate. So nature based solutions to climate are hugely important and a massive investment opportunity in the future. Currently getting only 3% of climate finance, yet offering about 40% of what we can do in the coming decades to stabilize climate. So we've got to think differently about this. So what's the problem? Next slide, please. Um, you know, it's a bit early for the dead bird picture, isn't it? But I'm going to show it to you anyway, because this is an albatross chick from Midway Island, which is one of the most uh, remote islands in the world, in the Pacific. And my chum, Chris Jordan, went out there to photograph what was happening, hoping he'd find a paradise. And instead, he, he discovered a nightmare because the mothers and the fathers were feeding their chicks so much plastic that they were picking up in the ocean, thinking they were shrimps, that the chicks were all dying. And the question of this slide poses, you know, who's responsible for that? Is it the fishermen who are leaving stuff out in the ocean? Is it the food system that's demanding more fish? Is it the finance system that's paying for the fishing uh, industry? Uh, is it us as consumers? Obviously, we're all connected into this. And what TNFD is trying to look at is to get some handle on this so that we can uh, not only get the data, the standards, the metrics, uh, and a reporting and disclosure framework that sort of takes account of all this. Next slide, please. So what did we do? Uh, why is this important? Mark has really set this out. 44 trillion of our economy is dependent, highly dependent or moderately dependent on services from nature, according to the World Economic Forum. It's got into the top risk that CEOs are really thinking of now. And now we're all trying to think, well, what's the equivalent for nature of a, a net zero target that Mark's already mentioned as, could we have a goal of uh, nature positive by 2030? Could you have 30% of your portfolio being nature positive by 2030? And how would you measure that? And what does it mean? And that's what uh, we're working towards. Next slide, please. Um, there's some big money opportunities here. 10 trillion could be generated in annual business value by 2030 in nature positive transitions. Uh, and uh, again, sources like IPBS and others have put these sort of figures together. The conservation financing gap, you know, 590 to 800 billion that we need to protect nature. But as Mark has pointed out, we spend about 150 billion a year protecting nature, but the uh, subsidies that are destroying nature are uh, four, five, seven times that. So we, even if we doubled all the money, we wouldn't get close to uh, combating the problems from subsidies alone. Next slide, please. I apologize, there are a lot of slides here, but I'm gonna give you an impression. So the great problem is that, you know, nature is invisible to most people, particularly to finance ministries and finance institutions. The, the, the valuation of nature and the support into the economy is largely silent and invisible. And that's what's beginning to change. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so um, it plays out in companies. Some of you might remember the Pacific Gas and Electricity Corporation that tanked a few years ago because of the fires in California. And this plays out in physical transition and systemic risks that you can see there in green, just like the TCFD. Those same things happen in nature. So 18,000 buildings going up in flames, 85 deaths, regulatory lists, uh, risks and lawsuits. There was a $13 billion settlement eventually. As a result, the share price tanked, the company went bust, the CEO lost their job. The systemic risk was that they were taking a levy off uh, the energy system this, com this company was running to pay for renewable energy, but that disappeared as well. So there are systemic risks that come from left field that you're not necessarily expecting. Uh, next slide, please. 
So what is the TNFD? I've already mentioned it. You've got a block of financial institutions. You can see over there on the left, you can see the corporates who are involved and service providers, all the big four are in, but some of the data providers like S&P uh, are, are in there as well. It's market led uh, and uh, the forum 600 plus now 650 of institutional supporters around the world, supported by the G7, and we hope the G20 will come out with some more supportive words next year. It's science-based, so we're pulling in the best uh, information we can from many different knowledge partners around the world. And I want to say thank you to the, the funders, of course, and particularly the UK that has done so much to help get this off the ground, not only politically, but also financially, and the Swiss and the Dutch, the US and others there that you can see who are supporting, and particularly the pro bono support of all the institutions involved. Next slide, please. So, you know, this is what's coming in here. Mark has already talked about this. We've got the sort of policy goals of COP15, uh, the Global Biodiversity Framework, We've got COP27 coming up shortly. And then on the left, we've got the revolution that's happening in scientific and measurement. I think it'll be a mixture of, you know, satellites, drones and phones that are going to transform our knowledge of how the earth is changing down to a meter and on a daily basis. It's staggering how the technology is. And you know, if, if Elon Musk gets 40,000 satellites up there, we're going to have absolutely amazing coverage of what's happening on the earth. And then the other thing that's happening is changing investor expectations. You would have seen this happening over the last few years with the rise of ESG investing, moving from climate to nature uh, and uh, all of that. Now, there's been a bit of pushback this year, but I see those as bumps in the road. Uh, climate change and nature loss are still going to be here 10 years from now, but I doubt Putin will be and maybe uh, the, uh, the Ukrainian war will be over, we hope so. But these are long-term systemic changes that are happening. And that's been reflected in the regulations that are coming out as well, as you've seen, uh, particularly in the EU, tightening regulations on nature, taxonomies. We're seeing just Parliament last month voting in strong regulatory uh, mandates for stopping deforestation risk commodities coming into the EU, and also illegal fishing. So all of this is really catching up fast. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, what about the framework? Well, we started out in October last year to try and put all this together. A couple of reports have already come out. Um, we call these beta frameworks. The third beta framework is coming out in November there, version 03, you can see in the middle of that chart. The next one will be out in February and the final one in September next year. This is an iterative process. We welcome uh, in input from anyone. You can go on the website, you can read these beta frameworks and put your ideas in. We really welcome that. And by September next year, we'll have the framework out there. It won't be perfect. It will improve over time. And uh, we'll then go into the uptake phase. Next slide, please. Um, we've had to create um, a sort of periodic table of nature, a new language to understand what we mean. So don't go and think about this too much. Just look on the left, the realms, land, freshwater, ocean, atmosphere, and then biomes, environmental assets. We're trying to create a common language that everyone can understand here. Next slide, please. Um, it's very close to the TCFD. We're very closely aligned with them. We talk with them a lot. So anyone who's used to the sort of TCFD architecture will find the same sort of architecture coming out uh, in the uh, TNFD. That's really the only point I wanted to make with this slide. Uh, next one, please. Now, this one is interesting. This is our approach for how you deal with nature related risk for financial institutions. And we've come up with something called LEAP, which means locate, evaluate, assess and prepare. Don't worry about the detail here. Just look at that. Locate, evaluate, assess and prepare. Now, what's really different here is location. Nature related risk is very spatially important. If you've got a mining site you're investing or lending to, whether it's in a desert or a delta makes a difference. Uh, where nature is concerned. Whereas emissions, they go off anywhere and go up into the atmosphere. It's not the same. So something really fundamental we have to begin to understand in our portfolios, whether we're lending 
uh, or investing is that where is the location of our assets and we don't traditionally collect that data and we need to ask companies you know do you really know where all your assets are could you collect that data and that's something where we're having a look at is how could we start collecting this data then you evaluate uh, the dependencies and impacts on nature the risks and opportunities and the assess and then prepare and respond get ready to report you won't release everything of course but you have to decide what it is you do want to disclose next slide please um, metrics, pretty tough. We found 3,000 metrics out there. We're boiling those down. Uh, look out for our metrics paper, which is coming out uh, in November alongside the next uh, iteration of the framework. So we are really looking at those metrics and the data that flows into those metrics. Next one, please. Um, you can participate by taking part in a pilot. We've currently got about 130 pilots of the beta framework going on around the world. Uh, just go to the website you can register your interests but be sympathetic we've had so many people wanting to do pilots we can't keep up so you can do your own just have a go at it and there are some which are official ones we're really hold, doing a lot of hand holding uh, next slide um, this shows you the partners we've got an african partner if you happen to be in africa fsd africa global canopy is doing a lot based in oxford based on forestry agribusiness and land use change and so on mining and metals you can see so you can join any one of these partnerships if you're a dfi uh, on, on um, you can work with afd in paris uh, next slide please so that's really it uh, have a think about this. We'll talk about it more in the Q&A. What can you do? You could join the forum. You can do that easily just by filling in a form on the website. I think the important message is start building capacity on this. This is a big and complex thing. Don't ignore it. Regulation is coming anyway. And then check out the website. So lots of tools and assets there, such as Encore, or even the little book of investing in nature, which is a really good guide on all this stuff. So have a look and uh, see what you can find. Uh, next slide. And thank you very much. Thank you. Andrew, thank you so much for that. That was um, brilliant. Some big numbers there, both on the the opportunity, but also the, the financing gap. But I think a really comprehensive framework that's uh, that's emerging from all of this. So um, before we go on to our next speaker, I can see that there's been questions in the chat. Please do post your questions in the Q&A box so that, um, so that we can get to those when we get into our, our Q&A and start voting on the ones that you want our speakers to answer the most. Um, I think there's also lots of different comments coming in on the chat. So as I said at the beginning, um, we'd love you to continue this conversation online. If you had something inspir inspiring or, or a takeaway from today, then do share it using our hashtag CA Summit 2022. So uh, let me introduce our, our next speaker. We saw GSK on one of Andrew's slides there. So um, I'd like to introduce Sarah Dyson, who is Head of Corporate Responsibility. Sarah, over to you. Thanks, Jessica, and thanks for inviting me this morning. For those of you who aren't familiar with GSK, we're a global biopharma company with revenues of about £24.5 billion in pharmaceuticals and vaccines, around 70,000 employees and operations in over 80 markets. So this morning, I'm going to cover three main areas. Firstly, an overview of our environmental strategy and goals with a focus on nature. Secondly, why we think these nature frameworks are important and beneficial for our business. And then lastly, how we at GSK are preparing for nature related frameworks. Next slide, please. So I just wanted to take a moment to share how ESG is an integral part of our company strategy. We see ESG as supporting sustainable performance and long term growth building trust with our stakeholders and reducing risk to operations and enabling delivery of positive social impact. We prioritize our resources around six ESG focus areas, as you'll see here. And of course, environment is what I'm going to discuss today. Next slide, please. To ensure delivery of our environmental goals, we're integrating them into our operations. We have board oversight for ESG, primarily through our Corporate Responsibility Committee. The GSK leadership team regularly discusses ESG topics and there's clear management responsibility across each of our six ESG focus areas. Our Sustainability Council includes senior leaders from the business, such as manufacturing, R&D, procurement, facilities management, and they're all working together to deliver our environmental targets and embed them as a standard working practice. 
Next slide, please. So we have bold ambitions for a net zero, nature positive and healthier planet. And this is across our value chain. So from discovery through to disposal. For climate, we have a high ambition pathway to net zero, including an 80% emissions reduction target by 2030, alongside investing in high quality nature-based solutions. For nature, we know that our business relies on thriving natural ecosystems, whether it's the raw materials we use in our medicines, the water we use in our manufacturing, or scientists looking to nature for inspiration. We see our ambition for a nature positive world as going beyond just minimizing our impacts to making an important contribution to the global goal to halt and reverse nature loss by 2030 with a view to full recovery by 2050. Next slide, please. So we recognise the interrelationship between the impact on climate and nature loss, and of course, the impact on human health. Our climate and nature strategies are mutually reinforcing as many of the solutions have multiple benefits. I'm gonna focus on the nature targets on this slide. And I think what's important to understand is that we're taking a two pronged approach to our nature ambitions. Firstly, we have our no regret actions. And these are the ones that you see here broken down into three areas, water, waste and materials and biodiversity. These are the targets that we set in 2020 and we're progressing well against them. And we're of course open to evolving these targets as we better understand the data to help us contribute to a nature positive world. Examples of the progress that we've made for example, in water, which is a key part of our nature strategy, we're committed to all GSK sites complying with our water stewardship code by 2025. This involves reducing the amount of water we use, improving the water quality, minimizing discharges, and working with the community and public sector stakeholders to address the local water challenges. These are context-based goals which mean they reflect the water base and challenges. Also at our sites where water resources are under stress, we've committed to water neutrality by 2030, which means that we will go further and take collaborative action to carry out water and sanitation education and infrastructure initiatives across the water basin. We've identified eight initial water basins in water stressed areas where we have manufacturing sites including Algeria, India and Pakistan, which will prioritise for investment in water neutrality in a way that is responsible and responsive to local, local challenges. For waste and materials, in 2020, we achieved zero waste to landfill at our, all of our sites, and we've made good progress in reducing and recovering the waste from our sites through circular routes like reuse and recycling, for our supply chain, we're building a detailed waste footprint to identify hotspots. And we'll use these, this footprint to engage suppliers on waste reduction. And it will also help us find opportunities to reduce our product's end of life waste. So our biodiversity targets also span our operations and supply chain. For our operations, we've committed to a net positive biodiversity impact at our sites by 2030. So this is going to require investment at a site level to improve habitats, protect species, and improve soil and water quality. In 2021, we piloted the approach with baseline assessments and set action plans for three sites. An example is our Stevenage site in the UK, where we've created a landscape plan in partnership with Kew Gardens to deliver a 39% biodiversity increase, which includes grass, woodlands and heathlands. And we're also working with Natural England to calculate the additional benefit for water and air quality in human health. To address biodiversity in our supply chain, our target is that 100% 
of our agricultural, forestry and marine derived materials will be sustainably sourced and deforestation free by 2030. The complexity of our operations and supply chain means that this is an ambitious undertaking requiring a phased approach. Next slide, please. So as we all know, and as we've just heard, measuring and accounting for how companies impact the natural world is very much an emerging field. And we want to be part of that journey. And we're collaborating with partners to understand how best to measure our nature impacts and meet industry standards. We're working with the Science-Based Targets Network for Nature to trial the methodology for our sector. We will align to the SBTN approach to measure our impact on nature and our dependencies, and we'll seek to accredit our targets when the methodology is finalised. I also sit on the Task Force on Nature-Related Financial Disclosure, and GSK is part of the pilot programme to assist the Task Force in developing the disclosure guidelines. So if our existing targets are part of the first, the first part of our two-pronged approach, then here is how we are looking and thinking about the second area, which is focused on understanding our impact and dependencies on nature and evolving our approach to contribute to a nature positive world. The first phase involves assessing materiality across the value chain, and we're using SBTN recommended tools for this. We're prioritizing that we're doing this by prioritizing our highest risk commodities to identify hotspots for nature impact and dependencies across the value chain. This materiality assessment will help us define science based targets and metrics. And of course, based on the materiality assessment, we will quantify financial risk based on impact and dependencies on nature using the natural capital approach. This will support GSK's TNFD disclosures over time. So in summary, our approach is designed to respond to the key risks and opportunities for long term business success and to build trust with stakeholders. We're delivering an ambitious sustainability goals is at the heart of GSK's purpose, strategy and culture and a key driver in our goal to deliver health impact and long-term growth. We see it as an intrinsic link um, between climate and nature targets. And some of our projects will have a carbon angle, some will have a nature angle, but they will all aim to achieve and measure benefits for climate, nature and health to meet our KPIs and ensure overall systemic impact. So I hope that's been a good summary and I'm looking forward to the Q&A. So over, back to you, Jessica. Sarah, thank you so much. And, and great to, to hear some of those examples of, of the partnerships that you're, that you're developing um, around nature. So we'll, we'll hear more about that when we get to the Q&A. But let's get on to our, our final speaker. Um, and that is Annabelle Nelson, who is the head of ESG Policy and Disclosure at MNG. So Annabelle, over to you. Thanks, Jessica, and um, thanks for inviting me uh, on this panel. Um, so I've been asked to provide the investor perspective, uh, but first let me tell you a bit about uh, MNG. Um, so next slide, please. So who who is MNG? Who are we? Well, we're an international savings and investment company. Um, and we have about uh, we have retail customers and institutional clients. So about five, over five million retail customers and institutional clients of around eight hundred. Um, and we are investing um, as both an asset owner and as an asset manager. And we're a global investor, and we've got around three hundred and forty nine billion pounds of assets under management. And we invest in pretty much all asset classes, sectors. And geographies and our purpose is to help people manage and grow their savings and, and investments responsibly. So why are we invested in nature? Well Mark and Andrew have given a really compelling overview of why nature matters and put simply nature underpins all life on earth and we're stretching the limits of the complex planetary systems which regulate our world and that is causing 
systemic risks. And when you think that our global economy requires 1.7 Earths to provide the resources we need to absorb our waste, and the changes we need to move our global economy to operating within the resources of the one Earth we actually have, you realise that the change is going to be profound. And there's a big social dimension here too, because sadly, it tends to be the poorest who are experiencing the worst effects from climate change and the degradation of our, our natural environment. So there needs to be a just transition that shares the costs and the benefits equally between communities, regions and generations. Effective action to address climate change, biodiversity, social inequality requires systems thinking thinking about both the people and the planet. So as a big global investor, that is what we're thinking about. That's why it's of relevance to us, but it's also of relevance to everyone. So we can move to the next slide, please. And we've seen the experience of the last couple of years, COVID, the war in Ukraine, the extreme droughts and uh, floods across the globe. Um, has precipitated um, real food insecurity, real uh, economic shocks, and it's really exposed the vulnerability of our globalised uh, economy. And climate is just one element, as we've heard, I mean, uh, Sarah put it very, um, very eloquently, it's just one element of our complex planetary system. And through the Though the Paris Agreement has galvanised action to reduce carbon emissions and governments, governments across the globe are now recognising the need to build resilience by acting to protect the whole of, uh, of the environment. Um, because, because climate change, biodiversity, pollution, poverty, they're all interdependent, they're all interconnected. So I've included here a quote from the G7 from, from June this year, which kind of makes this point. And, you know, we are, we were really pleased that the G7 uh, supported the, the launch of the, the TNFD. It's great news that governments are taking action. Um, and that's why, um, you know, one of the reasons why we've been focused on nature is because it's, it's the interconnect, it's the, it underpins uh, effective action on climate, effective, effective action on, on social equality. So let me take you through what M&G has been doing as an investor. Firstly, we're building our understanding of the environmental issues, social uh, issues and the interconnect, the intersection. And we're undertaking both uh, generic, oh sorry, general thematic research, as well as targeted biodiversity themed company uh, research. And as we've heard, one of the biggest challenges is the sheer complexity of nature. There's no simple common factor we can point to like there is for climate and carbon. As, uh, as Andrew pointed out, the factors are very location specific. So we started to develop a high level biodiversity materiality heat map to help us identify the biodiversity risks um, hotspots and the key themes across sectors and geographies. So we started to plot uh, overarching biodiversity themes like deforestation, land use degradation, air pollution, freshwater and marine, uh, marine pollution. And we've plotted these against sectors for our, invest uh, our investments. So assessing for each biodiversity theme, the sectors, biodiversity uh, impacts and dependencies. And we've assigned a high level materiality ratings for these uh, respectively. And then we've also started to assess the location specificity and we've plotted these same themes against different geographical uh, regions and assigned high level materiality ratings to these two. And this is helping us to identify where the most significant biodiversity risks are across our investment book. But I must stress we're at a very early stage and we've got a lot more work to do. Um, but um, I was pleased to see that, you know, it's our approach that we're adopting is, is consistent with that proposed by the LEAP framework that Andrew, Andrew referred to. Um, the next thing I'd say is um, the reason our planet's in this critical mess, frankly, is because we've treated the goods and services that nature provides and upon which we depend as free and unlimited. And so we've ex overexploited them. 
Um, we may live, let, give me one, let me give you one example. We may live on a blue planet, but 97% of, of our water is salt water. Only 3% is fresh. And about half of that is tied up in polar uh, ice fields and glaciers. So we don't really want to access that. So when you think about it, all the world's water that we need for drinking, for agriculture, for hygiene, for industrial processes is coming from about 1.4% of our water resources on the planet. So that's effectively finite, but the demand on that is, is growing, not least because there are more of us, the population is growing. And we fail to recognise that just like produced capital, as, as uh, Mark shows in his, his first slide, uh, natural capital degrades and depreciates if it's not looked after. But unlike other forms of capital, there is often no substitute for it. There is no substitute for fresh water. Nature is complex and there are vast amounts of data points. So as a sector, not only do we need to be better informed, but we need better access to relevant data to inform our investment decision making. And that is the key reason why we've been firm supporters from the key FD and um, we're part of the, uh, the, the forum. It's also why we've been collaborating with other in, uh, institutions and civil society bodies, for example, CGP. We've been collaborating with them for the last year on their water questionnaire that many on this call might be, uh, be being requested to, to complete. Um, it's uh, CGP send their questionnaire out to, to corporates. And we're working with them to help give the investment perspective to better target uh, disclosure of relevant comparable investment decision uh, information that's useful for, for investors so that to help guide guide corporates. And more generally, we're also uh, collaborating with other NGOs and our peers because affecting meaningful change is going to entail in an iterative approach. We've got to be collaborative, we've got to do knowledge sharing, and we've got to learn from different stakeholders. This is most definitely a team sport. Um, as an asset manager, we undertake uh, company engagements on both a bilateral basis and working collectively with uh, other uh, investors. Um, and as an asset owner, we look at mandate design. So we're looking, we're starting to consider um, the drivers and causes of biodiversity loss in our mandate formation, as well as um, looking at uh, developing specific mandates which directly support the transition to nature positive outcomes. And lastly, um, I flag advocacy. This is a really core part of our approach as well. And it's one of the reasons, frankly, I'm, 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 I'm speaking at this event today. Um, we are working with our trade associations, with NGOs, with our peers. We're engaging with policymakers and regulators to drive climate ac action and to help curb biodiversity loss. So next slide, please. So this is my final slide, because we relieved to know. Um, the, the purpose of this slide is to try and kind of give the investor perspective and, and um, help explain what we as investors are looking to from, you, from your disclosures on, on, on nature. In most cases, your investors will be looking to make a financial return in their investment on your business. Their interests in your disclosure, disclosures boil down to helping them form an opinion on your business, including the nature-related risks and opportunities your business faces, and the implications that has, or they have, on the five drivers of capital. For example, how will it affect your sales and therefore your revenue? Are you going to experience uh, an increase or a decrease in your cost base? Will you be needing to make significant capital investment, I don't know, new plant, desalination plants? A lot of uh, miners are, are having to do that because water is a really big part of the mining process. And a lot of uh, natural resources are location specific, not necessarily in areas where there is significant water availability. Will your liabilities increase? So um, Andrew mentioned litigation risk, it is real. Um, and how, how will all of these affect the value of your assets, uh, stranded asset risks? 
So we're looking at all the things through these five drivers of investment, the stops, the flows, and the value that, that, that Andrew mentioned, uh, Mark mentioned. And investors are making decisions about their investment in your company relative to alternative opportunities that they have or, or holding cash. So the key drivers of your disclosure is, 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 is whether your disclosure is just data or whether it's actually investment decision useful information. And this comes down to content, whether it's specific, whether it's relevant, whether it's comparable. Remember, we're making relative decisions here. And also whether we have to provide nature uh, related investment, and um, we also have to provide nature related uh, disclosures in our investments. And so investors are looking for quantitative disclosures which are aligned to our regulatory requirements. And then the other element of it is context. So insight into the relative importance of these nature related factors or other sustainability factors, so climate, social inequality, and how this informs uh, how things could change for your business over the short, medium and long term and your ability to respond and take necessary action. Now, this could be a function of technology. It could be a function of your, uh, your firm's resources, your knowledge. Are you alive to these issues? Because remember, as investors, we're frequently looking at your company, but we'll be looking at your peers across your sector as well. So we'll be triangulating our understanding and also other factors, for example, you know, where are you operating? What's the context to the countries in which you operate? So keep in mind that we are investing on behalf of savers and pension funds. Um, so ultimately, your investors want to understand what are the risks and opportunities you face, how well you, you are managing them, and how you can mitigate those risks and take advantage of those opportunities. And therefore, how that's going to affect your financial performance and our investments. And with that, thanks very much. And I'll hand back to Jessica. Lavelle, thank you so much. And really interesting, I think, just to hear you talk us through that, that penultimate slide. So um, for our second bit of the session, we're going to invite all of our speakers to turn their cameras on and come back um, to join us for a Q&A. And I would like to introduce and hand over to our executive director, Steve Kenzie, who is going to chair this discussion. Steve, over to you. Thanks very much, Jess. Thank you, Mark, Andrew, Sarah, and Annabelle for your, your fantastic contributions to get us going. Um, before I pose a first question, I just want to also thank the audience for all of the questions that have gone into, into the Q&A box. Let me just remind you of our terms of engagement um, with regards to Q&A. So we want questions for the uh, panel to go into the Q&A box. That's where I'm going to be looking. And I'm going to be looking for those, first of all, that have the most votes. So I'd really like to ask for your help uh, from the audience to go in there, have a scan um, of the questions and give a thumbs up to the ones that you would like us to focus on first. I'm afraid that we've only got 25 minutes or so for Q&A and there are currently 15 open questions. I think there's a very strong likelihood that we're not going to get to them all. And our philosophy is we want to be talking about the issues that are most important to you. And so we really do need your support. Get in there, scan those questions, give a thumbs up to the ones you want us to address first. And off we go. And I note there are a few questions that have been going into the chat. Um, they're not going to get thumbs up and they're not going to get posted or posed to our, our fantastic panelists. So please, and, and it's not out of laziness that we don't just move them over. Um, we're not allowed to ask ourselves questions. So we can't post questions ourselves into the Q&A. So if you put it there, we need you to transfer it over. And also finally, no comments in the Q&A, please. Um, that's what's supposed to go into the chat. Okay, fabulous. Wow, look at all those votes now that have started coming in. Much appreciated. And do please keep that going. Um, let's get started with the first question then, um, from Anne, um, and it's a perennial question at UN Global Compact events because about half of our participants are smaller companies. So Anne asks, SMEs are often challenged with a lack of knowledge, lack of time and lack of power. For example, what would the panel suggest as a starter action? 
I'm thinking, Mark, this one's coming to you uh, to start with, but then you know, be very keen because I know Sarah, you'll have SMEs in your supply chain, and you're probably trying to influence their behavior as well. So maybe uh, we come to you next. So I, um, SMEs are, are, are a perennial problem, I think, or, and it's not a problem. That's wrong, completely the wrong way to frame it. It's a challenge for organizations when we're working very much with bigger organizations to then make sure it's relevant and useful to, to uh, smaller or medium enterprises. There are things, very simple steps that can be taken. I think the first thing is, is there's now tools that will allow you to get what Annabelle was calling there that, you know, relative importance and worth, the impact of what you're doing. So there's tools that are very, very low cost that will allow you to get a, a review of where you are at the moment in that system. So there's also um, projects, so working most closely, so on big, uh, um, projects that are looking at construction or something like that you'll get a lot of small SMEs involved in a process like that working together through that process is often the best way of being able to pick it up so working through your value chain or through the supply chain together rather than actually having to put in the resources directly yourself but there are tools and resources that there's some several on our website now to help to actually purposely focus on SMEs and making sure that they're able to contribute there's no use if we get this mandatory requirement coming in at the top and then that gets passed down, that's not going to be helpful to anyone if we aren't able to support SMEs in being able to deliver. Thanks, Mark. Sarah, are, have you got programs in place to support, you know, down your supply chain? Yeah, so I suppose my answer is twofold, just taking a step back, because a lot of, um, a lot of what we've discussed today is very complex and I suppose that's why I focused on a sort of two-pronged <coughs> approach of no regret actions whilst you're trying to sort of work out the probably more tricky and complex issues so you know those actions the no regret actions I suppose are the ones where you intuitively know that those are the right things to start addressing without even needing absolutely loads of data um, so that's why that's why it's important to talk, sort of look at it in, in those two ways. Um, you know, we do collaborate a lot with both suppliers, but also with our peers as well. So, um, you know, on the climate side, um, we're a member of a program called Energize with um, other pharmaceutical companies. I think there's nine other pharma companies as part of that. And that is helping our suppliers get access to renewable energy through um, purchase power agreements. So collaborating with our, um, with our peers and our suppliers to help address um, some of these issues. So um, sort of, yeah, using, using the power that you've got with other companies as well as sort of directly engaging with your suppliers as well. Maybe I'm gonna follow up with a bit more of a, a philosophical general question and, and pardon to everybody that's you know, voted but I think it, it it's a really fundamental thing for me in this and, and I'm really interested in hearing you, your views uh, just around the drivers for action and and I think you know we're stuck in a real tragedy of the commons kind of situation here and, and so often in matters of ESG and and sustainability there's a clear business case at the micro level where um, company reduces their energy, you know, their energy output, they're reducing their carbon, but also reducing their energy bills. Or there's a, perhaps a, a created value uh, or, or driver insofar as there's regulation or investors are asking for it. So there's a clear benefit at a micro business level to taking action, for example, on climate change or diversity and inclusion or what have you. It's less clear to me um, how action on nature yet leads to that direct benefit that um, a resource constrained SME um, is gonna see that I invest this in nature is going to come back directly in in a benefit, and I, and I can see how you know projects like the TNFD are creating those sort of drivers where there will become forces to to incentivize. But you know, frankly, it it still feels maybe a company operating at the scale of GSK, you you, 
you do operate more on, on on all of nature and and you can see that that direct payback but i'm just wondering how you know and and similarly i, I think you know annabella there's a perhaps a, a rationale here for you know a global investor to care can i invite comments on that yeah annabelle you please start well excuse me i would say it comes down to risk so if you're a small company or an enormous company you probably need capital, whether it's your own or somebody else's. And what you, you should be looking at is uh, what's the risk? When I look at sustainability, I think about um, you know, it's meeting the needs of the present so that future generations can meet their own needs. But I also could think about it in terms of long term viability. Are you going to be in business for the long term? So, yes, there are degrees of um, importance on different issues but ultimately if we boil it down to its 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 fundamentals there are things that uh, we depend upon that if we don't husband those resources will not be available um, we're seeing the effects of climate change uh, on a on a kind of uh, a, a local level you know there's been a lot of comment this year about the the lack of bugs on the windscreen in the summer you know these changes are observable, they are real, they are happening now. Um, so if you're the, the impetus to, um, to take action is really to manage risk. And for us as investors, we're looking to understand how are those risks arriving? What are the drivers? What are the interconnections? What can we do about them? And we want to put our money into those actions that will support the positive change and move away from the negatives. Um, for us, it's about the efficient allocation of capital. That's that's the whole purpose of the, the, the capital markets. One of the, the key things is what determines efficiency. So there's regulatory, uh, there's regulation in policy that, that Mark referred to, the subsidies. Um, and there's also behavior change. Um, what are the what are the opportunities? It's what we all do as individuals, as companies, as countries that drive efficiency, that drive change. So that's that's why it's relevant, and that's why we as a sector are are, are interested. And if I could just jump in there as well, you know, your your resilience as a business um, is 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 part of this as well. So. You know, if you're operating in a water stressed area and not doing anything about that, then, you know, that site or that supplier is not going to be resilient over the long term. And and that's just the way it's going, it is and is going to be. So, you know, I, I don't necessarily I agree with you as to, oh, it's so much easier just to quantify it on climate. I think when you with water, for example, I think you can easily sort of quantify those risks um, within sort of the nature. And I think having organizations like yours and um, the, the growing, I guess, social and regulatory expectation that, that companies are starting to manage these, um, these impacts is going to create the necessary drivers for action. So, yeah, that's really reassuring. Thank you. Okay, next question. Um, there's been a lot of interest... Uh, in the question from Joshua, Andrew has already provided a written answer, but Andrew, I, I get a sense that the audience wants more. Um, so the, the question from Joshua was, um, the risk is that such a framework exists in isolation. And I think such a framework, he's referring to TNFD, um, exists in isolation where much of the momentum now exists within carbon and net zero. To what extent will this framework integrate into this other agenda and andrew you you did say you're you're working closely with tcfd and also issb um which is working on integrating could you elaborate just a little further on how that integration is going and um yeah sure um yeah. look i think these frameworks are only as useful as the take-up they have <clears throat> around the world and if you look at the pattern that's happened with the tcfd on climate um, that started out voluntary. Uh, not many people were doing it. When the Paris Agreement and the TCFD were launched, you know, there was a tremendous uh, kicker 
in understanding about climate. <clears throat> they, and people started to want to get to understand this issue much more. And so in a voluntary way, they started to use um, the TCFD. But that's just the first step in the room on all of these things that are affecting our Earth. Because after climate, nature's next. And in fact, we should be doing it in parallel, uh, not just in, in sequence. And beyond that lies the SDGs. Ultimately, that produces the complete holistic framework of things we should all be working towards. So um, I think uh, what happens is you, you get ready with, with something like TCFD. I don't know if it's really changing the cost of capital yet, because uh, that's the critical thing is uh, whether lending or investing changes uh, because of the way in which uh, companies are damaging our atmosphere or not. And it'll be the same thing for nature. As we uh, start to work on that, more and more we start to identify who the good guys are and who the bad guys are. That changes the movement of money fundamentally. And if we don't change the movement of money fundamentally, we will continue to finance ourselves into extinction. So they do have to get integrated. At the moment, TCFD and TNFD are cousins, like two overlapping circles. The overlap is emissions coming from landscapes and forests and things like that, which TCFD doesn't have too much to do with right now, but we do at TNFD. So it's integrated there. And the body which has been launched at COP26 to try and integrate all this, uh, uh, these standards, and remember TNFD is not a standard, um, we are just a, a reporting and disclosure framework, uh, is the Inter International Sustainability Standards Board. They're working on climate at the moment, how to unify climate reporting. They will need eventually to move to these other things. And what's your level of optimism? We've seen TCFD, at least in the UK, start to be integrated into the more formal regulatory, statutory reporting regime. <clears throat> Are you optimistic? That, that TNFD is going to follow the same pathway? Well, TCFD was first mandated by Paris uh, and the French. And the French are also the first to, I think one of the other questions is who's mandating biodiversity reporting? Well, France is. And they have tacked biodiversity onto Article 29 uh, in the French law, which means that you have to start reporting on biodiversity risk uh, in, in French businesses and financial institutions. Now, most people don't know how to do that. And the French say, well, we don't mind if you don't know how to do it. We're going to ask you to do it already because that speeds up the process. Others say, well, there's no point in us doing it until there's a mandate. So which way around is it? It's a kind of chicken and egg thing. But the French have, in a way, set the standard on this. Now, lots of other countries are looking at climate reporting. The UK's already done it. New Zealand's doing it. The Swiss are doing it. You know, it's spreading around the world. We'll see it uh, come up most in the EU. I think the same thing will happen for nature. Uh, TNFD is not calling for this because we are remaining, in a sense, neutral on that issue. But a hundred companies have called for it uh, recently in UN Climate Week. Mark has already mentioned Article 15 uh, inside the Global Biodiversity Framework is calling for mandatory reporting on nature. So I think it's going to happen. It needs to happen eventually because that's the fastest way to make people take it up. But there needs in these things to be a bit of a voluntary phase whilst people get used to the idea and learn how to do it. Mark, you want to come in? Yeah, uh, just on that, a, a couple of things on, on that. Um, just quickly, the target 15 and the COP15 is calling for this reporting, but it's also calling for assessment. And that's really important. It's actually really key that you actually don't just disclose things, but you actually understand what that means for your organization as well. And we are seeing, um, there's a food and beverage company out in Singapore that is now getting lower cost of financial capital because it's able to do those risks that Annabelle was talking about, identify them and get the flow of money. So Andrew, I completely agree. It's not mainstream yet, but there are certain BNP Paribas, uh, Asset Management and DBS Bank and various others that are now adjusting their ESG scores based around a natural capital approach to be able to get that money to flow. And I think that's going to be key. And as I was showing out in that loop that's behind me here, um, the, with the TNFD, with the LEAP model, that's coming directly out of it. It's very consistent. It's all of the same definitions that you're using in the protocol. So you can come and do an assessment using the natural capital protocol, and then that will feed into your TNFD disclosures and understanding the risks and opportunities. They're not separate things. It is a system. We work very closely. I talk to Tony and David Craig and everything. Every, almost you know, every week we're sitting down and chatting because we want to make sure this is based for the user. This isn't just another framework we're coming out with. This is user focused. 
I, I just like to make a further point on this, if I may. It's not just happening with companies, it's happening with countries as well, because sovereign wealth funds and even the credit rating of countries are increasingly going to be examined through the lens of their stewardship of natural capital, not just financial capital. So one might conceive uh, there are now uh, new reports coming out on this, such as Finance for Nature, or Nature Finance, as it's now called, um, has come out with a very interesting report on this. So I could conceive of a time in the future where a country's credit risk rating may alter if they're damaging their natural capital significantly, because the ability that is essentially undermining the economy of the country, the resilience of the country, and therefore their ability to pay back debt, and that will get priced in. Great points. Annabelle, do you want to come in? Yeah, um, I would challenge that climate and nature, uh, the frameworks uh, uh, are separate. Um, TCFG, I have a bit of a bugbear of mind that, that climate is being reductively simplified to carbon. Climate change, the drivers of climate change aren't just uh, the, uh, the emissions of carbon. There are all the, uh, the, a lot of the drivers of climate change are also the same drivers of nature, natural capital destruction. Uh, and the risks of climate change uh, our, our water, our, our, our soil fertility, there's so much, there, there's so much uh, pollution, but there's so much greater. So I think that the first point is um, when firms are completing their TCFG disclosures, they're required to think about the risks and opportunities of climate change to their business, uh, the outside in, and also the inside out, what can they do uh, and the impacts on them. Um, and so there's already, there's already at a high level quite an overlap there. The other one, and uh, Mark alluded to it, is um, one of the key challenges is valuing these externalities, these negative or positive goods and bags that were, 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 um, were, were are a consequence of climate change and of nature. And the only way that we as a financiers in the, in the finance sector can do that is to have a better understanding and then data. Uh, uh, and then turning that data into information to be able to form a view. So the, the disclosure frameworks, the accounting uh, uh, approaches, they're all, they all need to work as, as Mark's uh, uh, excellent uh, infinity chart, I don't know what you call it, Mark, uh, describes. So all interconnected, and, and we as financiers, you know, we are starting, I, I, I think there are, there are players who are further ahead, um, but I think as, a, as a, a sector, we are starting collectively to try and build our understanding because we know it's real. We know the issues are real. Thanks, Annabelle. Couldn't agree more. In fact, that's the, the premise of our summit is, is that we need to take a holistic approach to climate action and that, the, that reducing carbon has to sit within uh, a wider agenda, be that either... Uh, a nature agenda as well, or within the SDGs, um, if we're going to achieve a, a comprehensive and just transition. Okay, back to our questions, and, and thank you for them. Keep sending them and keep voting. Now, the, the next one at the top is from Deborah, and I'm kind of feeling like we may have answered it already. Um, all these frameworks are great and necessary. However, they create huge burden in reporting as companies have limited capacity. Are you working to have these frameworks converged and globally accepted? Is there anything more to say about that? Or maybe, Sarah, you probably are at the coal face of uh, the reporting burden. Um, how do you feel about how do you feel about that? Alignment is good. <laughs> so, yes. Anything that we can do to align any of these reporting um, frameworks, then any company, large or small, is going to, is wanting that. So you know that's what we've all got to advocate for, um, both as companies and you know organisations like TNFD, Capitals Coalition. Everyone's got to be advocating for the for the alignment as much as we can of these reporting frameworks. Definitely. There is also sorry, Sarah. There's also there's also a step that we're involved with at the moment, which about digitalizing. So in the financial markets, XBRL was the system that started to tag up all of the different financial numbers and put them into a system where they could be digitalized. So it doesn't matter which reporting framework you use, you can go in and draw out the information you need. 
because if it's record, recorded in the SEC, the Securities Exchange Commission in the US, it asks for one thing, but in Europe it asks for something else. They can both be tagged similarly and pulled out. We're starting a project now, the digitalization of sustainability data, and Liv Watson and various others that were involved in setting XBRL are now looking to do that with sustainability data. So if we can build that in from the beginning into all of these frameworks, that digitalization of it, then actually you wouldn't need to report 20 different times in 20 different jurisdictions and all of that, because actually the data can start to be tagged. And if it's tagged, you can pull down the relevant information you need. So we need to build that in now, rather than actually coming up with all these frameworks and then trying to retrofit it, that's the problem. So we, we, um, we're just housing that project at the moment for the next few months. There's one other thing, just quickly, I just realized, this is a, a figure from David Craig, actually, um, Andrew, that I saw the other day he was showing. Um, of nature is 37, thereabouts, 35, 37% of the climate solution. Okay, there's plenty of studies on this showing that actually nature is gonna deliver over a third of the solution for climate. But only 2% of the investment at the moment is going into nature-based solutions. Most of it's going into technology, which isn't going to deliver as much of the solution. So we've got the wrong investment model. We're not investing enough in nature when it's actually a big part of the solution that we're looking at. Have you got money on our debate later today, Mark? Because it sounds like you're trying to influence the outcome. Our, our final session of our summit is going to be nature versus technology. So I, I hope um, everyone will be able to come back for that uh, and, and hear um, counter arguments to what Mark has just uh, as just said, um, but really reassuring. I can give you the stats if you want, if that helps. Well, I trust <laughs> that the uh, the nature team this afternoon has, has has got that, but maybe we can put you in touch. Um, really well, actually, reassuring to know you guys are on the case, um, and that concern about reporting burden is is in the board of TNFD. Um, so that's great, Andrew. Did you want to comment? Yeah, I, I really wanted to support what Mark is saying. Um, it's patently obvious that nature is by far the biggest system for capturing carbon on the planet. It always has been. The planet used to be 95% CO2 a few billion years ago. And today, most people don't really know the amount, but it's only 0.04% CO2 in our atmosphere. It's very sensitive because it's so small. Now, it wasn't machines that did that. It was trees and plankton. Uh, it, and we fail to understand how powerful nature is. And I think soil carbon is probably one of the areas where it's going to take off. We're already beginning to see the first carbon credits being sold by managing our soil in a regenerative way. And the scale of opportunity there, and it's not difficult to measure, it's not difficult to execute, and it will be far cheaper than building carbon capture and storage machines that put a ton of black goo under the North Sea. And what the difference is that nature is alive and uh, other kinds of carbon uh, capture methods is dead. So we're not, it's not either or, we're probably gonna have to do both, but at the moment, all the conversation is in the wrong place, uh, or at least in one place. And we need much more attention and investment uh, and scaling up of uh, nature-based solutions. All right, thank you all. Next question from Krizula. Um, Andrew, you started to answer this. Um, so we know France are, are asking um, the question, which countries have regulatory requirement for biodiversity reporting for companies? Um, any others that come to mind? If Costa Rica, uh, Brazil, probably would be really nice to see it, but uh, depending on how that election goes, we'll, we'll have to... Uh, Wait and see. Any others that are leading the charge that we can look to as, as good examples beyond France? There are. I mean, well, the, the, uh, go on, Mark. Go on, Andrew. Yeah, Mark, you probably know better than me, but the only one that mandates it through a, a sort of reporting and disclosure framework that I know is, is, is France. There are lots of others that require you to do things like environmental reporting of one kind or another if you're doing major in, um, building projects and so on, EIAs, and environmental impact assessments and so on. Those are required in many countries, but um, uh, Mark, you may know others that actually mandate it in some form. No, I, I was going to say the same thing, that France really is the only one that moment's mandating, but there's lots that are doing things. So the system of environmental economic, economic accounts, which is national level accounting, was turned into a standard in 2021. 
and is being signed up by over 80 governments now. And like I said, I, I took a team to the White House when Obama was in there advocating for that to be applied. It was a five-year hiatus. I can't remember why, but there must have been some other president in power or something. And then a new president came in and it's now being picked up again. So we've actually seen that actually, and there are over 80 now that are doing those accounts. The problem with that is, is they're doing accounts at a national level, but it's not feeding into the policy. And we've got to start with what the policy question is and then do the accounts to inform the policy. And there's a few places, um, particularly New Zealand, Scotland, Costa Rica and other places that are starting to do that. They haven't gone as far as France as to mandate um, the process yet. OK, thank you very much. And now. It's who I am. We're out of time, but I really want to ask this last question. So uh, if we could be really brief um because I, I think it's a nice general question to end on from neil has the interest in esg changed people's risk return timeline are people willing to have a slower growth for a more sustainable future or are people still looking for growth and esg maybe annabelle you could uh you could close us out uh, with a brief answer to, to that question i think it's an end um, I think there's a recognition that ESG isn't separate or sustainability isn't separate from financial return. It's part and parcel of financial return. So I'm looking at this from the perspective of finance. Um, we are long term investors. So we have to think about those things that are going to impact the long term return. So we would be crazy not to think about sustainability. And when you think that financial return accounting bases have historically been, they are objective, but they're essentially backward looking. And we know they're incomplete. They don't value nature properly. We have to think, we have to take a forward looking approach because we are long-term investors. So we have to think about sustainability and ESG. So I don't think it's slower growth. I think it is better measured value that will hopefully encourage longer term sustainable growth. I hope that's a, that's sufficient. Yes, and and perfectly brief as well. So thank you so much. Okay, I have a couple of uh, announcements that I have to make. So I'm going to have to bring this to an end with with thank yous. Um, Mark, Andrew, Sarah, Annabelle, it's been a pleasure speaking with you. Thanks so much for your presentations earlier and your and your candor and, and to be so generous with your time and knowledge, um, really appreciated. Thanks to the audience for giving us um, such interesting questions to work with and for your lively engagement in the chat as well. We really appreciate that. Um, this is bringing an end to the first session of day two of our summit. Um, and so, yeah, again, thank you very much everyone for joining up next implementing nature-based solutions for net positive business. So we're going to explore how to identify and implement credible, effective nature-based solutions and how these can not only be used to offset remaining carbon emissions, but also move your company towards net positive. It should be a really interesting session starting in just over 30 minutes from now. If you haven't um, registered, you do have to register for that session separately. Registering for this session does not automatically put you onto there. There's a link just gone into the chat um, that will take you to the registration page. So we hope we'll see you there. After that, um, we'll be looking at investing in nature um, at 1.30 UK time. And then finally, the debate that I mentioned earlier um, is going to start at 315. Um, it's online and live. If you've got a ticket um, to join us in person, do please um, do please let us know if anything has changed and you're not going to be able to make it. Um, places were quite limited and we want to make sure everyone that was interested in attending is able to do so. Okay, uh, next slide, please. Um, just a quick announcement about some other activities coming up from the Global Compact Network UK. Next week, we're gonna have the third session in our Social Mobility Improving Business and Society webinar series. Um, the first two sessions in the series um, went very well, really interesting, valuable stuff in a really business critical issue. Uh, 
And finally, last week, we launched Measuring Up 2.0, which was a comprehensive review of how the UK is doing towards achieving the SDGs. We mobilized a group of 100 volunteers to do deep dives um, into it. Um, lots of content there specific to today's events. Deep analysis on the UK's progress or lack thereof around strengthening biodiversity, conserving nature, taking action on climate. So I, I highly recommend that. And again, a link has just gone into the chat. Um, if you're not already following us on Twitter or LinkedIn, please do so. There's our, there's our tags there. Um, after we close the session, there will be a quick survey. It just takes two minutes. We'd really appreciate your feedback there and or in the chat, but you don't have much time to, to type it into the chat now. Um, and I think uh, just a final call out, if you are using social media, our hashtag CA Summit 2022. Um, thank you very, very much, everyone, and have a great afternoon. We'll see you again soon.